Hello, everyone, and Happy New Year. Welcome to the first Dutch webinar of 2023. My name is Alan Strozier. I'm a member of the marketing team for Precision Analytical, creators of the Dutch Test. Today, we have our very own Director of Clinical Education, Dr. Debbie Rice, joining us for a deep dive into cortisol, the HPA axis, and the body's response to stress. We hope this information will help you and your patients recover from a stressful holiday season and start strong this year. If you're new to the Dutch test, Dutch stands for Dried Urine Test for Comprehensive Hormones. It's a group of validated tests providing the most complete evaluation of sex and adrenal hormones, including metabolites. With simple and convenient at-home collection for patients and in-depth clinical education and support, providers can have all the tools they need to become hormone experts and profoundly change the lives of their patients. Speaking of education, we've recently launched live group mentorship, uh, mentorship sessions where providers can learn how to extract the most clinical value from the Dutch reports. This is the best opportunity to learn how to really get the most out of the Dutch test for your patients. Bring a Dutch report with, uh, with you to get guidance and interpret, on interpretation and the chance to ask your most burning questions. Registered Dutch providers can access these sessions and much more on your provider portal. If you haven't signed up to become a Dutch provider yet, registering is easy. Just click the link we've posted in the chat and complete the Become a Prov Provider form on our website. Sign up today and you'll also receive 50% off your first five test kits, plus patient referrals and the expert hormone education I mentioned earlier. Now a few housekeeping notes before we get started. You can find today's slides in the handout section of the control panel on your screen. This webinar is also being recorded and everyone who registered will receive the recording via email tomorrow. If you have questions along the way, add them to the questions section of the control panel as well. We'll conduct a short Q&A after the presentation. Lastly, please keep in mind that the contents of this webinar are for educational and informational purposes only. The information is not to be interpreted as or mistaken for clinical advice. Please consult a medical professional or healthcare provider for medical advice, diagnoses, or treatment. Patients, you can find a Dutch provider near you on dutchtest.com by clicking the Find a Provider button at the top of the page. And now it's time for me to introduce today's speaker. Dr. Debbie Rice is the Director of Clinical Education for Precision Analytical, creators of the Dutch Test, and she practices part-time as a naturopathic doctor where she focuses care on pediatric health, hormone health, thyroid health, and adrenal health. She has had experience working with com communities in need, both in the United States and internationally. Her training has been primarily in women's health, pediatric care, hormone therapy, and hormone function, as well as complementary adjunct care. Dr. Rice uses diet and lifestyle, botanical medicine, and conventional approaches to maximize care, and she meets her patients where they are in their health journey. Thank you, everyone, for joining us. Dr. Rice, we're ready when you are. Thank you, Alan. I'm so excited to be here and excited to um, start off the new year with, I know um, last year we were also talking about cortisol and stress. So I would like to put that plug in if you would like some more information on cortisol, the stress response. We have some nice goodies that are on the dutchtest.com website, um, previous webinars and some podcasts that go over cortisol. So cortisol is such a complex um, topic that I would love to be able to cover everything in one webinar like today, but it's just not going to happen. So um, it's really difficult to try to cover such a complex topic and idea and process um, that we, it's going to be one of those things where we're going to have multiple opportunities for learning and education and engagement. So um, hopefully this will add to some of that information that you guys have packed in your brains. Um, but we will start on this topic, uh, stress and how to recover and start strong in 2023. So you guys know my name is Debbie Rice. I am the Director of Clinical Education here at the Dutch Test. We already covered all of the good stuff. This is informational and educational only. If you have any questions, we are happy to answer questions, but just know that we would love to ensure that your provider has a chance to treat you as a patient, not us. So for today, our objectives are to understand what stress is and how the body reacts to stress understand the major hormones influencing our stress response, and to review the important factors affected by cortisol and stress. 
So the first thing to understand is what is stress? And we need to understand that stress is anything that creates an imbalance in our system. So our body wants to stay in homeostasis. We want to maintain a steady state, right? Like optimal stability, think your temperature, uh, fluid balance, your mood, your energy, your blood sugar. We want that to be in homeostasis. When we're not in homeostasis, it creates a stress on the system. So where does that stress come from? And the thing about stress is your stress response will happen whether it is real or perceived, right? Like if I'm touching you, that is a stress. But if you think about me touching you and how you might react to that, that is a perceived stress, right? Or uh, like a perceived, like a deadline, right? That's a perceived stress. It all has the same response. Your body doesn't have the ability to be like, oh, but that's good stress. Nope. It just looks at stress as on or off. So that stress can come in real or perceived fashion. So what I really love about this uh, visual is when we think about stress, we wanna think about that fight or flight response. And when we're thinking about that fight or flight response, this is something that starts in the brain. And there are two things that are happening when your body gets that initial stress response. The brain, activates the sympathetic nervous system, but it also activates that adrenal cortex system, so that adrenal signaling system. So you have two things that are happening when we start to initiate that fight or flight or stress response from the brain. One of the things about the autonomic nervous system that we want to understand is the difference between the sympathetic nervous system and the parasympathetic nervous system. So the sympathetic nervous system is that fight or flight, that go, that run, that do, the go, 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 like you're in action when it comes to sympathetic. The parasympathetic nervous system is the calm, the rest, when you digest, when you can relax. So this is the off on part of that autonomic nervous system. And you'll probably hear a lot more people talk about the sympathetic nervous system over the parasympathetic nervous system, but that's because it's also that go, fight, flight, keep you safe. The other part of that stress response is how the brain sends that information to the adrenal glands. So we wanna understand what the adrenal glands are doing when they get that signal. Our adrenal glands sit on top of our kidneys. We have two kidneys, which means we have two adrenal glands. The hormones that we'll really be focusing on today are cortisol, which comes from your adrenal cortex. That's in the zona fasciculata of the uh, adrenal gland. And catecholamines, the catecholamines that we'll be talking about today are epinephrine and norepinephrine. So these catecholamines are also produced in the adrenal gland and they are produced from the adrenal medulla. So we get cortisol from the adrenal cortex, catecholamines are epinephrine and norepinephrine from the adrenal medulla. So the HPA response, why we call it that is because it's, it's coordinating to the hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis, HPA. And the reason why we call it this is because when you get a stressor, that stressor sends a signal to your brain and the hypothalamus starts this cascade of hormone events so that you can get ready to fight or fly from whatever that stressor is. From here, the hypothalamus releases a corticotropin releasing hormone or CRH. This is in the paraventricular nucleus. CRH is uh, signals to the pituitary gland, anterior, anterior pituitary gland. And the pituitary gland then releases ACTH. ACTH then sends signals to the adrenal glands then the adrenal glands release cortisol. And like really the big picture of this is that brain will signal to the adrenal glands by releasing ACTH. The more ACTH you get to the adrenal glands, the more cortisol is released. Therefore, the less ACTH, the less cortisol. So this is a, uh, it seems like a simple process, but there's all sorts of signaling that happens from your brain to the adrenal glands to get that cortisol moving for you. Cortisol, as we talked about, is produced in the zona fasciculata in the adrenal cortex of the adrenal glands. It is a glucocorticoid. That means that this relies on sugar, right? So it's a steroid hormone that utilizes sugar and fats to mediate a response. And cortisol is released in response to stress. And it's important here to understand that it's released in the presence of low blood sugar, which is also considered a stressor. 
because it is a glucocorticoid and it uses glucose for its actions, the things that cortisol does when it has that initial or that acute stress response is it blocks insulin to keep glucose in the bloodstream so that you can keep your cells moving and going. It induces gluconeogenesis. This is the breakdown of glucose from your fat cells in your liver. It reduces protein uptake, so it diverts to gluconeogenesis so that it can keep glucose in circulation. It also suppresses the immune system to deal with stress, right? Like if you're running from a saber-toothed tiger, you don't have time to get sick, right? Like you have to run from your saber-toothed tiger. It also increases blood pressure so you can get blood pumping and going to where it needs to go. Cortisol also improves focus, mental and physical. It improves your eyesight and improves your hearing, right? Like you have to have everything on and ready so that you can run or fight from whatever that stressor is. The short-term effects of cortisol release are that it can be anti-inflammatory. You have to have the ability and energy to fight and deal with the stress. So we have that increased focus, increased blood pressure, increased heart rate and blood flow to your muscles. But this also means we have decreased digestive effort, decreased sex hormone response, and decreased immune response, right? Like when you are running from a saber-toothed tiger, you don't have time to digest that Thanksgiving meal. You don't have time for sexy time and you don't have time to get sick, right? So your body is really just focusing on making sure that you are safe. Now, sometimes what happens is if you get a stressor and another stressor and another stressor, and this could be all sorts of different little saber tooth tigers that are piling up on your plate, your body doesn't have the chance to just deal with that one stressor and then heal itself or um, like uh, reset itself you start to get into this long-term cortisol response. And so because that initial response to stress is supposed to help keep you safe, what ends up happening is we get an imbalance in how the body is responding to stress. So this is where we start to see the long-term effects of cortisol release blood sugar dysregulation uh, or blood sugar irregularities. And this can start to lead to things like diabetes and insulin dysregulation or insulin resistance. Weight gain specifically around the middle. Immune suppression or immune dysregulation, you get sick easier or it's more difficult for you to recover. Chronic fatigue because your body has been running, running, running. The gastrointestinal issues, that part where your body is supposed to be um, shutting down that digestion so that you can focus on running. This leads to parasympathetic nervous system suppression. And so this is where you can have complications um, or symptoms associated with constipation, diarrhea, heartburn, stomach upset, right? Bloating, your body's just not digesting very well because it doesn't have the time to. It hasn't been able to rest long enough to be able to allow for sufficient digestion. Um, cardiovascular concerns, because we have blood vessel constriction, we have overcompensation of the cardiovascular system. So this is really coming out as high blood pressure is probably one of the first things that we look at with long-term stress. And then sex hormone imbalances, right? Again, no time for sexy time. So what happens is you can have uh, irregular periods, you can have concerns with infertility, heavy periods, low libido and sex drive. So we see that the long-term effect of cortisol is not just one thing, right? Like it's a multi-system uh, effect that happens when your body is trying to keep you safe. So cortisol's short-term purpose is to try to keep you safe, right? Enable you to run from your saber-toothed tiger. And your saber-toothed tiger may look like work stress, relationship stress, exercise, blood sugar dysregulation, all of, different, all of the different things that you can think of that are adding stress to you. Again, it can be real or it can be perceived. So even if you're thinking about what work could be, that perceived stress is also still signaling that stress response for you. We need to understand that the stress response begins in the brain, not the adrenal glands. The brain signals the adrenal glands for the cortisol response. And when we're looking at this, we are, we're, this is where we're going to talk a little bit about that cortisol versus the catecholamines. So um, your cortisol, which is released from that adrenal cortex, is part of the slower response to stress. So the body makes cortisol as needed when it is signaled. It is not made and then stored. And this usually occurs after a stressor, stressor signals the brain. And the lag time is usually about 10 minutes after that epinephrine and norepinephrine have been released. So the fast response to stress comes from your catecholamines. This is your epinephrine and your norepinephrine that are produced in the adrenal medulla. 
when you get a stressor, this is what helps you like really jump into action. This is the immediate release of that stored epinephrine and norepinephrine. These are amines that the body makes and stores to be ready for a threat. So as soon as you feel that threat, the epinephrine and norepinephrine are going. And then cortisol comes in to keep that response going for you. So that epinephrine and norepinephrine are like, boom, right away. Cortisol's like, all right, I'm coming in and helping you complete that stress response. So they work together. Um, to initiate and continue that stress response. So the expansion of that picture that we had talked about earlier is when that hypothalamus gets the signal for the stress, it activates that sympathetic nervous system, but also act activates that adrenal signaling system. And we can see in this flow chart here that it um, starts to affect different parts of the system, right? So we look at what's happening in the brain. We look at how your pupils dilate so you can have better eyesight. Your heart rate accelerates. Your adrenal glands are producing hormones. Your stomach slows digestion. Um, your hair shafts actually become um, erect, right? Because they are running from things, which tells us that your hair follicles also have cortisol receptors. Think about that with stress and hair loss. Um, your lungs, right, start breathing faster. Your muscles tense up because they're ready to do whatever they need to do. Your liver starts to support that blood sugar um, and your bladder relaxes. This is why some people, when they are stressed, depending on what happens, um, you can see some changes in bowels too. So now we know the stress response starts in the brain from the hypothalamus, right? It triggers a response from both the autonomic nervous system, mostly the sympathetic part, and the adrenal gland cascade. So in the stress response, one of the things that happens is as soon as we initiate that cascade, our body relies on a negative feedback loop so that our brain knows when to stop signaling that stress response, right? So this means that when there is enough of signaling from the hypothalamus to the pituitary gland, to the adrenal cortex, um, once we have enough cortisol to deal with whatever stress we're dealing with, we send a negative feedback loop where we, the cortisol levels get read back to the brain that we have enough cortisol, we can stop that hypothalamic pituitary adrenal response. So our body does rely on not just the signaling to start that stress response, but the negative feedback loop so that we can stop that stress response. That affects the HPA axis. With our cortisol release, one of the things that um, outside of just the stressors that happen, our cortisol is very closely tied to our daily rhythm, right? So this is also known as our circadian rhythm. In this picture here, the red line is our cortisol response. And what we see is our cortisol begins to peak around 9 a.m. and then starts to wane and slow down so that we can go to sleep and then melatonin can take over at night, right? So cortisol is is considered your daytime hormone. Melatonin is considered your nighttime hormone. Cortisol has to get everything going and moving for the day, then pass the baton to melatonin. So this diurnal rhythm or circadian pattern is really important in how that cortisol works for you, right? Like we expect that cortisol will begin to rise that is the hope that you have an appropriate cortisol rise in the morning and then fall later in the day. The other thing here is DHA is another one of those adrenal hormones. It does also have a diurnal pattern similar to cortisol. Cortisol and our circadian rhythm. So the circadian rhythm is a 24 hour internal clock that's regulated by the suprachiasmatic nucleus or the SCN. This measures the sleepiness and wakefulness for our brain and body in that 24 hour cycle. This nuclei is part of the brain that signals the hypothalamus and is, is responsible for signaling cortisol and melatonin release. So that SCN is also part of that signaling cascade for cortisol. And because of that circadian rhythm, we rely on the SCN to help support that cortisol release in the morning to get us up and going for our day. The suprachiasmatic nucleus is sensitive to any sort of light, daylight, screen light, think blue light, and false light, right? Like house lights. The rhythm is determined from light, not dark. And so this is just a little side note. When, they, when they've taken people and put them like in a cave, what they find is that their circadian rhythm gets a little bit um, off, but as soon as they are put back in light, their body gets back onto a 24 hour circadian rhythm because it relies on the light factor. 
So part of that circadian rhythm is sleep. So sleep is regulated by our HPA axis. If HPA axis dysfunction is present, sleep disturbance is also likely present. So sleep is affected by cortisol, norepinephrine, and melatonin. That's just a handful of some of the hormones that are involved in sleep. What I like about this picture is this shows us our stress, right? That brain response to stress. And we can see the perceived stress starts this whole cascade that can affect some of our neurotransmitters, right? So serotonin and GABA are more of the calming neurotransmitters. Dopamine and glutamate are one of those more excitatory, like get you going neurotransmitters. So that's part of that stress balance, right? Like, do we need to be running and how do we balance that when we can rest? Um, the neurosteroids involved are DHEA, pregnenolone, and allosterone. Um, the mental emotional effects that can happen from these neurotransmitters and neurosteroids are it can affect your relationships, how you interact in those relationships, how those relationships stress you, the feelings, lack of control, burnout, right? So this is where we start to see like the effect and then the long-term effect that can become more dysregulated, right? So that stressor can start to add to dis. Uh, glycemic dysregulation. This can lead to poor diet choices, timing of meals, stress eating, that can lead to insulin resistance, that can lead to obesity and or low physical activity. Um, when stress occurs, this can also uh, start a cascade of inflammatory or immune signaling that happens. And depending on how those immune signals or inflammatory signals are regulated, we can start to see allergies, uh, skin diseases, cardiovascular diseases, arthritis, inflammation, right? So the more uncomfortable your body gets, the less movement your body has. And again, that can lead to low physical activity. Um, the other part is that circadian disruption, right? So if you are not sleeping well because your body is just ready to run, run, run all the time, and you also need to maybe rely on caffeine to make it through the day so that you can reach that deadline or get that thing done, it starts to affect that uh, circadian rhythm and how you're able to sleep and that sleepiness slash wakefulness, that appropriate balance in your body. The other part of that is, um, I, I love that daylight savings is on here. Um, when I was younger, daylight savings wasn't a huge issue. As I get older, it's definitely an issue. So my body is much more sensitive to that change in daylight savings. But we can also see this be a big disruption in people um, that travel a lot, travel different time zones and shift work, right? So depending on when your uh, work hours are, they can also affect your daytime slash nighttime balance or your wakefulness slash sleepiness. <clears throat> so when we're looking at that stress response, this is usually an excitatory signaling, right? Because that excitatory signal has to get you going and get you up and moving. So the hypothalamus in that paraventricular nucleus sends a signal to release corticotropin releasing hormone from the anter anterior pituitary. And we've already seen this, you know, displayed here. We start to get that signaling for ACTH sends to the adrenal glands to release cortisol. That other part is the norepinephrine release from the locus ceruleus. What happens with this is the norepinephrine is very excitatory and can also hit back to the corticotropin releasing hormone. And when that happens, so the norepinephrine is doing this because it's trying to keep you safe. But what that can end up happening is the more CRH continues to simulate that PVN for the hypothalamus again, and you get this circle of CRH continuing to signal to the brain to release ACTH and cortisol. So even though we are looking at a negative feedback from cortisol, if you're getting that negative feedback, the brain is trying to see like, okay, I have enough cortisol here to shut down cortisol production. But when the norepinephrine comes in and starts triggering the release of the CRH or that corticotropin releasing hormone, it continues to stimulate that ACTH. So you continue to get more cortisol signaling. So your body is getting this mixed signal, right? Because the norepinephrine is still trying to keep you safe. Even though the cortisol is like, we already have enough cortisol. We're running from our saber toothed tiger. We don't need more, but your norepinephrine is still sensing that stressor. So it's still telling your body, nope, even though we have this much cortisol, we're still going to keep releasing this cortisol because it is signaling for that stress response. 
in this, the signaling is stimulatory or excitatory. That excitatory signaling um, is part of that sympathetic nervous system response. So the excitatory hormones for the stress response include cortisol, norepinephrine, and glutamate. Glutamate is a big one that is excitatory. Then calming the stress response, which we're looking at for inhibitory, right? Like not creating that, it's that balance, the excitatory to inhibitory. The inhibitory part stimulates the parasympathetic nervous system. And those inhibitory hormones for that stress response include GABA and cortisol, right? So cortisol can signal to uh, in, um, increase that stress response, but it can also be part of reducing that stress response. So cortisol has two jobs, right? Um, but norepinephrine can really influence how cortisol, when cortisol is trying to slow down that response, norepinephrine can interfere with that. So when the body is in a sympathetic drive for too long and does not have the capacity to balance with parasympathetic rest, we become sympathetic dominant. This means that our threshold to turn on that stress response is much more easily reached and we're not able to create enough downtime to allow for appropriate rest, right? So we're in that sympathetic dominant state. <clears throat> So great, Debbie, then how am I supposed to sleep if I'm always uh, in that sympathetic mode? In a pillow fort, that is how. The reason why I say that is we wanna make sleep a priority. We wanna make sleep something that you look forward to and we also wanna make sleep fun. It is difficult though when you are running from a saber tooth tiger to think of sleep as fun. So let's talk about sleep physiology and Dr. Bradley Bush did a, a wonderful um, review of sleep and the sleep cycles because sleep is really complicated. Like there is so much research on sleep and there is so much research that needs to be done on sleep. But when we look at the cycles of sleep, our normal sleep cycles should include light sleep, deeper slow wave sleep, and REM sleep. So light sleep has two stages. Our first stage one of light sleep is the start of the sleep cycle. This is considered the transitioning from wakefulness to sleep that lasts about five to 10 minutes. This is where your brain goes into theta waves or slow brain waves, and you have slow rolling eye movement. Then you progress into stage two of light sleep. This lasts about 20 minutes. This is mixed brain, um, sorry, mixed frequency brain waves with rapid bursts of rhythmic brain activity known as sleep spindles. This is where your body temperature starts to decrease and your heart rate starts to slow. Then you go into stages three and four, which are part of your deeper and slow wave sleep. So your stage three, um, this says about 20 to 50% of your slow brain waves go into delta waves. This is transitional between light and very deep sleep. And then your stage four, which lasts about 30 minutes, you have uh, greater than 50% of delta waves happening in your brain, often referred to as delta sleep. So stage four sleep is your delta sleep. And then your stage five sleep is your REM sleep. REM is that rapid eye movement, right? So this is where you start to see increased breath rate and brain activity. REM sleep is mixed theta waves with rapid eye movement, and it occurs about every 90 minutes in adults. So in adults, slow wave sleep is generally the first half of the night. Your REM sleep is generally the second half of the night. So sleep starts out sequentially until it cycles through the stages, then it will go in and out of sequence. So sleep begins in stage one, then you go into stage two, three, and four. After stage four, then you go back to three, then two are repeated before you hit REM. And stage two usually occurs after your last REM cycle. So stage two is usually what's happening right before you wake up. And the first REM cycle usually occurs about 90 minutes after sleeping, um, but for a very short time. And each time REM is repeated, it lasts a little bit longer. So the more sleep you get, the more REM cycles you have. So the sleep-wake cycle influences your metabolism. That's looking at like hunger hormones like leptin and ghrelin. It influences your immunity. It influences your cognition, like how well you can think, muscular function and capacity, right? Like how strong or weak your body is. And overall recovery. This is recovery for all systems of your body. Sleep enables the body to reduce wakefulness, conserving energy and allowing rest. It allows the brain waste clearance, what we call being able to clear all the bad stuff out of your brain. 
um, as well as overall lymphatic clearance. So lymphatic tissue, think of um, like the waste in your overall system, right? Like in your whole body. So this is detoxification, right? If you don't have a lot of good sleep, you're not getting a lot of good brain waste clearance and you're not getting a lot of lymphatic clearance. Wakefulness, when our bodies are awake and doing things, we create more waste in the body and need clearance during and through sleep. So wakefulness is good, right? Like we're doing things, but because our body is doing so much stuff, our factories are moving, things are happening, we create more waste in the body. And if we don't have appropriate sleep, we're not able to detoxify appropriately. So how does cortisol affect sleep or vice versa? Because cortisol and melatonin are partners in the circadian rhythm response, it may be difficult to know from where the issue came, right? Did this, like, have you always had problems with sleep and that's part of what's happening? Or you were doing okay, but then all of a sudden there were these stressors and because of these stressors, you weren't able to sleep and because you weren't able to sleep then you're tired and you don't have good wakefulness, really gets this very vicious cycle that happens. Um, you can also see this with immune dysfunction. If you get sick, if your body is not recovering very well, um, inflammatory diseases can also be a part of that, right? Like when your body is inflamed and you're not able to uh, work your body appropriately, move your body appropriately, that can also negatively affect not not just your wakefulness, but also your sleep. The two major contributors to poor cortisol response are obstructive sleep apnea and insomnia. So when sleep is not optimal, it negatively affects our cortisol rhythm. Optimal sleep includes appropriate bedtimes, so optimal bedtime is usually around 11 p.m. for quality of sleep. You can get, say you go to bed at 2 a.m., and you wake up at 10 a.m., you get eight hours of sleep. That's a good amount of sleep, right? But your quality of sleep is not going to be as good if you um, go to bed after 11 p.m. So that eight hours of sleep could be better if you went to bed closer to 11 p.m. The other thing that we look at is sufficient time for sleep. So this can vary from person to person and depending on um, age ranges. We do know that teenagers um, have a shift in their diurnal rhythm and their sleep. So it's true, teenagers have a different demand for sleep, um, but in most adults, we require about five to seven consistent hours of sleep for optimal cortisol signaling. And um, the reason for that is if we don't get a good amount of sleep, the cortisol signaling gets off and we're not able to have that appropriate cortisol rise, right? So the ability to sleep through the night can also influence that. Interrupted sleep can also affect cortisol signaling. Whether that means that if you wake up at 3 a.m., your cortisol starts to rise then versus you, like you get this like kind of stop and start signaling for your cortisol. So by the time it's real and you wake up for the day, your cortisol has been kind of like trying to do this all night. And then it's like, oh, well, now it's my turn. And then it's like, oh, like it, it, it does not have a really nice rise in cortisol usually. So this is where that sleep factor can definitely affect how your cortisol responds in the morning. When sleep is not optimal, cortisol may be triggered too soon and wake our body too soon, or it can create a latent cortisol response. So that is what we would say is more like uh, secondary to not sleeping well. So you may finally fall asleep and be forced to wake up earlier than you are ready, which may lead to poor cortisol waking response because you haven't had enough sleep to be able to support an appropriate cortisol um, awakening response. So sleep has a big effect on how your cortisol responds in the morning. And if your cortisol is not responding well in the morning through the day, your daytime cortisol is not helpful in being able to support that sleep at night. So the circadian rhythm and your sleep-wake cycle regulation. So um, increased signaling to cytokines can activate your immune cells and inflammatory response if you don't have balanced circadian rhythm. So the things that are underlined here in the reds are that cytokines um, play a role in regulation of cognition, performance, appetite, pain, fatigue, sleepiness capacity to sleep and vasohemodynamics, which is like your um, temperature and how well your blood is flowing. So when we have increased signaling to cytokines, this means that we have uh, dysregulation in how we are going to think, how our body's going to perform, how we can manage our blood sugar. And that's where you start to see the things that 
are impacted by sleep disturbance, including diabetes, type 2 diabetes, cardiovascular disease, cancer, or immune-related uh, dysregulations. So uh, we can also see with um, imbalanced circadian rhythm that you can have increased inflammation in the brain um, that can negatively affect cognition. We're looking at brain fog, anxiety, mood changes, right? So you don't feel like you have good control of what's happening in your brain, right? Like your, your mood just isn't as optimal as it could be. So dysregulation of that sleep-wake cycle has been shown to increase risk for diabetes, cardiovascular disease, immune stimulation, inflammatory disease states, cognition deficits. So we're looking at brain fog, mood changes, depression, anxiety, focus, um, metabolic dysregulation. So appetite dysregulation, um, your body's ability to move and participate in physical activity. We can see these happen with dysregulation in the sleep cycle. So because our bodies rely on natural light to help stabilize that circadian clock, natural light may be an option for treatment. So not only does our brain register natural light to facilitate the rhythm of our body's clock, our cells are also sensitive to the 24 hour rhythm. And this picture here shows like this, um, that first picture that has an A on it shows that sunlight, right? Like it definitely hits that super um nucleus in the brain, but it also hits peripheral organs, meaning this shows that sunlight influences not just the brain, but also the individual cell types throughout the whole body, which is why sleep has a multi-system effect, right? Like it's not, it's not just a, a singular thing. It affects all of our organs, all of our cells. The bottom picture here I like because this tells us, right, that light factor we know influences the, that circadian rhythm and these circadian regulators are um, doing better when those are doing better, this can influence your oxygen efficiency, your mitochondrial function, endothelial function. Endothelial, think of like the cells that are around your blood vessels, the cells that are in your skin, the cells that are in your stomach. So our body needs oxygen. It needs healthy mitochondria to be able to do cellular functions. And all of our endothelium are important in making sure that they are pumping blood appropriately, that they are digesting things appropriately, right? So it's not just the brain signaling that is important in the circadian rhythm. The sunlight influences how each one of our cells um, moves appropriately or metabolizes efficiently in our body. So how do we evaluate sleep and cortisol? So first we would like to measure cortisol, right? So there's a difference between a free cortisol curve versus our cortisol awakening response. Now, both the diurnal rhythm of cortisol and the cortisol awakening response affect health outcomes. What we have seen that can be affected through cortisol and what cortisol does to the day are mood stability, mental health, including dementia, depression, anxiety, focus, cardiovascular disease, uh, high blood pressure, diabetes and blood sugar control, and immune regulation, both from like germs that we can get from outside sources as well as autoimmune regulation, right? Like when your body starts to signal destruction to your cells. So the CAR or the cortisol awakening response looks at stress resiliency. So the cortisol awakening response is really an important component of what your body's capacity is to appropriately respond to stressors, whatever they may be, the real versus perceived. And the cortisol awakening response is like a mini stress test to ensure appropriate HPA response to stress. As Dr. Carrie Jones says, if you can't get your car right, how do you expect the rest of your stress response to be right? Which is true, right? Like if you can't get that initial response going right, like what's gonna happen to the rest of your day? How are you supposed to respond to stress appropriately? Knowing that the cortisol awakening response is a mini stress test on the HPA axis, if this is not responding appropriately, we have a problem with how the body is dealing with stress, right? So that lets us know like, yep, we do not have the capacity to deal with this and we need to do something different. So the diurnal pattern, which is part of that circadian rhythm, is what we're looking at here. So the black solid line shows us what that expected cortisol should be doing. And we can see that we have a nice peak of cortisol around 9 a.m. And that correlates with the sunrise, right? That's what we're expecting. When we see the sunrise, 
we want to have an optimal level of cortisol around that 9 a.m. time. And then cortisol starts to fall throughout the rest of the day. And then we can see, right, it switches with melatonin, right? Hands off that baton and then melatonin starts to increase. Also around 9 p.m., hopefully peaking around, you know, midnight or so, and then dropping in the morning as cortisol starts to increase the next day. In cortisol testing, the things that we want to see or understand, we want to understand your capacity to make cortisol or your cortisol production. That is your metabolized cortisol. We want to understand the amount of free cortisol that your body is making. We also want to understand how your body is using that free cortisol. So what does that cortisol do during the day? We also wanna see what your melatonin production is, right? So that balance of what your cortisol is doing through the day as well as what melatonin is doing at night. The great thing is our Dutch test can offer that information. So we do have our Dutch Complete, which is our flagship test. It is dried urine only. It is four urine samples done throughout the day and then dried. Your first collection is at dinner time, again at bed, like right before bed as soon as you wake up for your day, and then two hours after waking for your day. There is an optional strip that if you wake in the middle of the night, you can also do a collection so we can see what that cortisol looks like in the middle of the night. The other component of evaluation is the Dutch Plus, which includes the cortisol awakening response. So this is everything that you do for a Dutch Complete. So you have your dried urine, but we also do a salivary collection. And there are five salivary collections here because the cortisol awakening response is um, very specific for collection time, meaning we need to do a collection as soon as you wake up. So you wanna um, get that tube, get that little salivate, soak that with saliva as soon as you wake up. We do that again 30 minutes after you wake up. We do that again 60 minutes after you wake up. And that is going to be part of your cortisol awakening response. We also do that cortisol, um, that salivary cortisol collection around like dinner time and again before bed. So this is a combination of both salivary and dried urine so that we can get all of the metabolites looking at your total cortisol production, which is that metabolized cortisol. And the reason why it's important to consider looking at the cortisol awakening response, again, because it is that mini stress test for HPA axis function. How is your stress response? How is your resiliency? Can you deal with stress? This is looking at that rise of cortisol from as soon as you wake up to 30 minutes after you wake up. We expect your cortisol again to start to rise in that diurnal curve. That waking to 30 minutes gives us a really good picture of how your HPA is responding to that stress. And that is your cortisol awakening response. We do get really great information from your daily free cortisol pattern. This is your four point cortisol curve. This shows your waking, your morning, your afternoon, and your nighttime. So we can see what that diurnal pattern for you looks like. That cortisol awakening response, um, that zero to 30 minutes or that waking to 30 minutes is what we're focusing on in that cortisol awakening response. So what we're looking at there is we want to know what that percent rises from waking to 30 minutes. We want to know what that resiliency looks like, looks like for you. And we want to know what those actual numbers are so we can understand what that uh, stress response is. So when we do that daily free cortisol pattern, that little green arrow is where your cortisol awakening response goes. So you can still get great information with a diurnal pattern, the four point cortisol curve. You get more information with a cortisol awakening response when we're looking at resiliency and sustainability of stress and stress response. So this is an example of someone who did a Dutch plus that has the cortisol awakening response in there. One of the things that we can see, so the shaded areas in the blue show what the expected diurnal pattern is for that salivary cortisol. This person's results are the blue line with the blue dots there. And what we can see is this is actually a negative cortisol awakening response. So what we're seeing here is this shows very poor HPA axis function in that diurnal pattern, it shows a negative car. And when we see a negative car, or we, see, we see a car that is not having an appropriate rise from waking to 30 minutes, this tells us this person has poor HPA resiliency, right? Like they're not able to mount a stress response. Their um, stress resiliency, like their capacity to be able to deal with stress is quite poor here, right? So 
we don't know what has led them up to this point, but what we do know in taking any kind of history or getting inf any information on that, we do know that moving forward, it is going to be problematic for them to be able to maintain that stress response appropriately. Some of the contributing factors could be stress. A lot of times it's stress. There could be sleep issues and it could be an inflammatory situation, right? This person might also be sick. Maybe their cortisol is really healthy most of the time, but maybe they are really sick right now. What we do know from this information and testing is that they have that poor HPA resiliency, so poor um, stress response, and um, that their capacity to move forward with stress in the future is pretty low and pretty poor. So when we're looking at poor cortisol awakening response and poor HPA response, this correlates with mood dysregulation, immune stress and autoimmune disease uh, risk, cognitive risk and decline, and metabolic dysfunction. And really what that translates to is a reduced quality of life, right? Like as much as you're like, well, I just need to do this and I just need to get through this and I just need to do, you know, like it's all the need to, need to have to, need to have to, right? But ultimately what we're looking at, like when we're looking at the long game here, this tells us it's a reduced quality of life. This is a red flag. This is where you need to pay attention. This is where we need to act, right? To make sure that we can um, intervene here. Um, this slide change takes uh, just a second and here we go. So cortisol and stress and how to make it better. So the big part of this discussion in cortisol is sleep. Right, so the idea is very simple. The implementation may be what is difficult, but regulating sleep is a huge, huge component of being able to regulate your stress response and that HPA response. Other components of that are move your body during the day, right? Like your body does better when you're moving in the light, right? Like maybe not outside, the body loves to be outside, but if you're doing something inside, it might be nicer on your system and supporting that circadian rhythm if it is light outside. Stabilizing your blood sugar, right? So, I, and I know I've said this before, when I look at the adrenal glands, I look at the adrenal glands like a puppy. And the reason for that is puppies are really good at routine, right? Like they, they know when it's bedtime, they know when it's time to eat. They know when it's time to go for their walk. They know when it's time to nap. They do so much better on routine. And it's the same thing with your adrenal glands. They love routine, right? So being able to have stable blood sugars is important. It's not just about what you put in your body, but when you put it in your body can make a big difference in stabilizing your blood sugar too and managing your stress. So that's a big one. When we talk about managing your stress, we're talking about lifestyle support in general, right? If you had to prioritize anything in looking at cortisol and stress and resetting your stress response, sleep. Regulating your sleep is going to be the biggest thing. And if you walk away today not knowing anything, just remember, Debbie said to regulate sleep. That will make my life better. That is the truth. And absolutely, once you tap into all of those lifestyle things, there are herbs and nutrients that can be helpful. Um, vitamin C and B vitamins are really important. When your body is stressed, your body goes through a lot of vitamin C and B6. And humans, we don't make our own vitamin C. So it's really important that we support our body with vitamin C. Again, I am not your doctor. I do not know your history. I do not know your health situation. So please discuss the best option for you with your individual with your provider for your individual case. But these are things that we have seen, right? Like stress uses up a lot of vitamin C. Stress uses up a lot of your B vitamins, vitamin B6. Um, your NAC, so N-acetylcysteine is an amino acid. Um, CoQ10 and PQQ, kind of like the cousin of uh, CoQ10, also help to support um, reducing oxidative stress. So when your cells are going, 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 and they're doing all of these things, the antioxidants of CoQ10 and PQQ are really helpful to support mitochondrial health. NAC is um, a, a potent antioxidant, but it can also help in balancing some of that um, brain hormone communication. Um, Ashwagandha is an herb, rhodiola is an herb to help with overall um, what we'd call modulation of that stress response. We do see that phosphatidylserine as an amino acid can be calming on the stress response. 
Magnolia has also been found to be more calming. So when we're looking at this, the other thing that I want to say is um, when your body is in such an excitatory state that you're not able to sleep, one of the major excitatory components of that is norepinephrine and glutamate. And things that can support relaxing that are things that support GABA. Right, so GABA is also something that you could consider, um, but anything that supports that calming and um, hitting those receptors for those GABA, um, those GABA receptors can help in calming that excitatory or that glutamate response when we're talking about sleep. Um, in this, this tells me you have the information to make educated decisions about your daily health. There's one thing about having the information, it's a whole other thing to be able to implement it. The, um, the major part of this discussion today is knowing, right? Like when we're looking at stress and that stress response and how the brain is responding to stress, we need to balance that with the calming part. And that calming part is to be able to restore yourself back to health with sleep and supporting that parasympathetic nervous system um, support right so whether that is with GABA whether that is with meditation and deep breath and prioritizing sleep making sure that you are getting to sleep appropriately if there is if there are things that cannot wait and you have deadlines just remember that as you deprioritize sleep you continue to deprioritize your health and that is a huge issue so your body has a cumulative response to poor sleep or deprioritizing your sleep. And even if you know a lot of adults and teenagers, kids end up using weekends to um, try to like have gains on sleep, right? Like we're gonna sleep in, we're gonna try to you know restore some of that sleep. When there is a continuous stressor and there is a continuous um, moving of prioritizing your sleep, your body becomes in, gets into that sleep deprivation and knowing, like if you already know that you are sleep deprived, just know that that is already starting to compromise that HPA response for you. That is how important sleep is and supporting that parasympathetic nervous system in balancing that sympathetic nervous system. So in looking at lifestyle choices, and I know it's not going to be, right, like people have to work, people have to maintain relationships. Some people are in a really difficult place where you are, you know, taking care of your family and you're also working and you're also the caretaker of someone else in your family. And those are all priorities, but it's important to look at what are the things that you can do to support that parasympathetic balance with your sympathetic nervous system, right? If that means that you have to add 10 minutes a day of deep breaths, then that's what you need to do. That's going to be part of that prioritization, right? There's really great research to support um, meditative breathing and helping to support um, resetting that stress response and helping to improve that HPA response. So that if you already know that you are tired, if you already know that you are not prioritizing sleep, then we already know that you have an issue with HPA balance. So make wise decisions as much as you can in prioritizing sleep. That will also help to support your HPA response and managing stress. You guys have any questions I am available but I did want to say as Alan had said at the beginning of our webinar um, you can receive up to 50% off on uh, up to five testing kits if you are a new provider with us um, one of the other things that I wanted to say is our clinical team we do have clinical consults we have mentor sessions which are group sessions that you can call in where we go over certain cases like postmenopausal females um, cycling females it's it's an opportunity to do some group learning which I think is also helpful. Um, you may not have the same question that somebody else has, and it's a really uh, great place to learn. We also have um, same day consults that you can call in as a provider. So we do have our clinical team on board to help out with that. That's great. Well, thanks so much, Dr. Rice, for the great presentation. Um, we really appreciate your time here today. We've, we've got a few questions uh, that I'll just take a few minutes to ask uh, from the chat. Um, I won't be able to get to all of them, but I just want to ask some of the the, the main questions that came up. Um, yeah. Can you talk a little bit about the connection between cortisol and cortisone. How are they interconnected, and where do they interconvert in the body? 
So that I may not be able to answer all of that simply. <laughs> um, what I will say is cortisol, free cortisol is your active form of cortisol. So that is the one that we uh, like the body is using um, readily. Cortisone is the inactive form of cortisol. And a lot of times what we see, depending on where a person is in stress, is how their body is choosing to activate cortisol or deactivate cortisone. If you've been in stress for a long time, your body's probably been shunting a lot to cortisol, that active cortisol, so that you can run from your saber-toothed tiger. Once you start to try to do that negative feedback loop, your body will start to create a little bit more cortisone so that we can have less active cortisol so that your body can start to slow down that need for cortisol and create that kind of balance for that negative feedback loop. Um, this inner conversion can happen in different locations in the body, um, but just know that your body has to make cortisol before it makes cortisone. And the body can rely on cortisone, cortisone stores if it needs to reactivate cortisone back into cortisol. So cortisone is kind of like, yes, we're going to deactivate you because we may not need all of that. But if we do, suddenly we can reactivate that uh, cortisone into cortisol for you. Okay, great. Thanks so much for clearing that up. Um, a lot of questions came through about sleep. Um, that was a pretty uh, popular uh, topic. Um, you mentioned that optimal bedtime is at 11 p.m. Now, me, myself, I'm more of a 9, 30, 10 o'clock kind of guy. So yeah. um, should, should people try to stay up till 11? Or, I mean, as long as, you know, you're asleep by that time, everything's okay. I think as long as you're asleep by 11 is where you're going to get good quality sleep. So if you are that kind of person that's like, hey, we're in bed by 8, 30, 9, awesome. That's great. You're getting wonderful benefits for quality of sleep and according to the circadian clock, which is good. Okay, cool. Um, and can people catch up by napping through the day or does that change, um, does that affect the, the car too much and change the cortisol? That is a great question. So if you're a napper that can like revive yourself in 30 minutes, you're probably not negatively shifting too much of your circadian rhythm. But if you're the napper that is like, oh man, I lay down and I have to nap for two to three hours that will likely shift that circadian rhythm for you. So that means you are likely not getting that optimal sleep in that like appropriate circadian rhythm. So napping's not bad as long as you're doing it within an appropriate time frame. And that might be different for some people. And I would say like, and looking at some of the research, there's some varied numbers between like 20 minutes to 45 minutes. But I think once you get beyond that 45 minute window, you start to get into like deeper REM sleep. And that's where we're getting into like circadian rhythm changes and probably affecting your cortisol. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, and can you talk a little bit about alcohol consumption and its effect on sleep uh, specifically, does it inhibit the body's ability to get into REM or is are there phases of the sleep cycle that you can't really get into? That's a great question. And I don't know the answer specifically for how, like where it affects the, um, the sleep stages. But anecdotally, what I do know is because of blood sugar changes that happen with alcohol, and I see, and it's really not fair because I see this happening in people that are probably like more in their 40s that are like, I just want to have wine with dinner. But when they do, they end up waking up in the middle of the night. And a lot of times that's because of some blood sugar changes that stimulates cortisol. So cortisol ends up um, spiking in the middle of the night and waking you up. Again, I don't I don't know how that correlates with the actual sleep cycles, but because of the cortisol and blood sugar dysregulation that can happen from alcohol, that's where you start to see that uh, discord with your sleep. Mm -hmm. uh, and we did have a question. Uh, women in menopause or perimenopause sometimes report sleep problems. Uh, is there a connection to cortisol dysregulation? So I will say Yes, direct and indirect, right? So there are multiple factors that can affect sleep for peri and menopausal females. Um, a big one of that is going to be estrogen, progesterone, and testosterone balance. And the hard part about that is as soon as you start to see sex hormones shift and that starts affecting your sleep, that can start to negatively affect your cortisol. And then you have this little... Um, suboptimal cycle of what's happening with your sex hormones as well as how your cortisol is trying to respond to that so the, it is multifactorial but definitely can be affected right great 
Um, so let's let's shift gear shift gears a bit and talk about the car and uh, with the Dutch Plus report. Yeah. Um, yeah. So what might you see, or I guess what would you recommend? Um, you know, a patient wakes before the sun rises. Maybe they they start work at you know six a.m. or something. Uh, uh, how might that affect their car um, and the, the cortisol awakening response? Yeah, so that's a really great question when we look at like how like daylight influences that waking. Um, like in the summer, it's probably a more robust cortisol awakening response. But the other part of that is when your body is more routine, right? Like if this has been something that you've been doing for years, your body probably hopefully has a routine waking response with that as long as you are able to get sufficient sleep prior to your car mm -hmm. so i think whether you wake up at 5 a.m whether you wake up at 7 a.m if it is more routine for you and and you're waking i would say my my rule of thumb that i recommend is that you wake up around the same hour every morning because that will also help to stabilize that cortisol awakening response because cortisol is also it tries to anticipate right and predict what your activity is going to be during the day and if you have a more routine schedule your cortisol has a better capacity to anticipate what that cortisol awakening response can be for you so if you're waking within like the 5 to 6 a.m window it's like routinely it's likely that your cortisol has been able to stabilize in response to that again as long as you are getting sufficient sleep prior right right gotcha yeah um and let's talk about testing day if you're taking a dutch plus um you know there can be stressors throughout the day that might show up in the car um even just testing, testing itself yeah do that um do you see that come up a lot? Uh, is it something that you um, you know consult providers on and how to understand sort of what happened throughout the day? If say for instance they you know had a stressful day at work and um, the car kind oh, of for sure. Oh yeah, we can definitely, like if it is out of character for what they usually do, we can usually see that, right? Like if, if somebody says, well, this patient was super stressed out and just taking the test. Um, so we can see that, or if they're like, you know, I got in a car accident on the way to work or something like that, we can absolutely see that, um, not just in the car, um, but through the whole um, like cortisol cascade through the day. Absolutely. Gotcha. Yeah. Something or something to look out for for sure um, yes yes all right uh this has been great thank you so much dr rice for this uh information uh we will be sending out a link to the recording and the slides tomorrow to everybody who registered um look out for our february webinar that'll come up soon and uh thank you everyone for joining us today um have a great 2023 thanks for having me thank you.